Hello, BookTube. Sorry about the weird camera angle here. I can't think of any other way to position a camera to do what we're going to do for the next 90,000 days, which is the, to, to do our library tour. Uh, we did the skinny bookcase, and if we're going around the room, just without fear or favor, then the next bookcase is this tall uh, bookcase right by the door that I call the Annex bookcase. Uh, and the reason I call it that is because I have, over here, I have a bookcase that lines one whole wall that is my workbooks. They are, they are the uh, review copies and finished copies of current books, of books that are currently under consideration or under commission for review. So the top shelf is the current month. And it's dwindled now because <laughs> July is almost over. So it's almost time to move all of those books up and organize them all over again. Um, and then each shelf below that is the subsequent month. That's that bookcase there, the only bookcase in this library tour that we're not going to be covering. Um, and when I move the books up, when I, when I you know go through them, cycle them up to the top and realize, okay, the month is almost over, I like to review things in the month that they appear, so these things don't make the cut, etc., etc. Uh, some of them, some of those books strike me as very worthy things that I don't right, right away want to get rid of. So I move them over. I used to have a tiny little bookcase that was a catch for all of those, and then an old friend of mine scoffed and said, you're going to exceed this in no time at all, and he was right. Uh, so now I have a tall, big bookcase that is an annex. It's, it's 2019 books from the beginning of the year uh, that, for one reason or another, I've held on to either because I want to keep them in my permanent collection or because I'm just not quite mentally done with them. You know how that is. Um, and that's what this whole bookcase is. So we're, we'll do the, uh, the we'll do shelf by shelf and, <laughs> and hopefully get through it anytime soon. Uh, so the first of these books is War and Peace by Nigel Hamilton. This is the third and final volume in his, his trilogy about President Franklin Delano Roosevelt during World War II. Why it's called War and Peace I have no idea. <laughs> it's the, the, one of the dumbest choices for a title. Might, might as well call it Anna Karenina. <laughs> but the book is tremendously good. Uh, and I reviewed it. I reviewed it in tandem with uh, this, Phillips Pace and O'Brien's book, The Second Most Powerful Man in the World, also a terrible title, about Admiral Leahy, who was uh, Roosevelt's right-hand man and often Erzat's decision-maker for the whole course of the war. Uh, and who's never had a long and serious biography before, so this was it was terrific to read, and uh, it was great fun to to review them together. Uh, then we have uh, this was from June. This is a novel that I ended up really liking. I don't remember if this was a debut. Uh, I think this was a debut, uh, but anyway, it's by Jake Wolf, and it's called The History of Living Forever. And on one level, on one on one uh, gimmicky level, it's about the hunt for the fountain of youth. But the thing that struck me about it, aside from, I loved the lyrical writing. I just loved it. Sometimes lyrical writing doesn't work for me. And in fact, most times it doesn't. Most, most times it strikes me as, you know, look, Ma, I'm writing. But in this case, I was thrilled to, to keep going and see what invigorating new ways the author was going to have to describe things. Uh, and but the the plot thing that really got to me the plot strand was uh, gay love, young gay love, and then mature and somewhat un, unsatisfied gay love. I I uh, haven't read a book so far this year that that uh, wrote on that subject anywhere near as good as this. So so I kept it. I this is the advanced copy. I feel certain that I kept the finished copy somewhere. <laughs> no idea where. We'll find it. We, we can't We can't miss it in this library tour. Uh, then we have the Alfred Russell Wallace Companion. It's a collection of essays about uh, the crackpot who accidentally <clears throat> partially co-originated uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection <laughs> and was uh, good-hearted enough and naive enough to send an abstract of his discoveries of his, of his thought to Charles Darwin in England who was horrified. He, he had come up with this idea a decade before and was horrified to see that, this, that it, it had been duplicated out in the field uh, and rushed to publish his own, The Origin of the Species. And the key takeaway from that story is not really that Darwin backstabbed Wallace or that Wallace was some sort of intuitive, feverish genius. I think the key backstory, uh, the key takeaway from that story is that the idea was brewing. 
all it took is sustained observation of the natural world to start to think, hmm, <laughs> if, if it hadn't, in other words, if it hadn't been Darwin or Wallace or both, it would have been somebody else at right about the same time. But this is a, a series of uh, essays about Wallace, and uh, some of them are tremendously good. I mean, in a collection like that, you're always going to have unevenness, but some of them, in, you know, worth, it's worth keeping the whole thing. Uh, then this next one is a paperback that you should all get. <laughs> this is Yuri Sleskin's The House of Government, a gigantic uh, work of nonfiction that is basically a Russian novel, a Soviet novel, the great Soviet novel, uh, about one gigantic apartment complex and all of the party officials who live there and their stories and when they got in and what they did there and how they got out. <laughs> and uh, the paperback has uh, a blurb by yours truly. Uh, right next to Tom Stoppard. <laughs> so that's pretty good. My favorite blurb story of the year so far, although the autumn has yet to come. <laughs> so, uh, then uh, a YA book, Wicked Fox, by Kat Cho, about a young girl who is actually a supernatural creature. She's actually a, a supernatural fox spirit, many-tailed fox spirit, who draws uh, life-sustaining and power-enhancing energy from both the moon and men, <laughs> the life essences of men. And much like the vampires in Anne Lestat's, uh, in Anne Rice's vampire stories, she she satisfies her predatory urges uh, by singling out unworthy men, <laughs> because and and meeting out on them uh, her supernatural fate. And in, because it's a YA novel, she falls in love with a boy, <laughs> and uh, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked it enough to keep when I've gone through a lot of YA and not kept it. Uh, the next one is Anna Fifield's uh, The Great Successor, about the dictator of North Korea, who is the, the best friend and also the love partner of the President of the United States, who says they are in love. Um, and this was, this was just wonderful. <laughs> it's biting and ironic, and yet fact-based, grounded in fact. I, I uh, think it's the best thing that's been done on this particular dictator. Uh, uh, next one is Slime. <laughs> this is uh, by Ruth Kasinger, and it is all about the title subject. It's all about all the different kinds of of algae and slime that fill the world, and always have. Uh, and I I thought, okay, this is you know this is kind of a one note thing. This will certain this is certainly meant to gross out the reader, but not anything else. But actually, uh, the author really makes a broader case uh, in a wonderful way. So I I, uh, I kept it. I also kept uh, along the same lines in the Valleys of the Great of the Noble Beyond uh, by John Zada about his Bigfoot book. And that's got to be here somewhere. But I, I felt it was the same thing. You could in both cases you could easily have written a different and much lesser book and still fulfilled your contract. Uh, okay, uh, this next one is also from June. I don't think I ever got this in a finished copy. I don't think I ever got. Hmm. Well, that's actually, with, with Annex bookcases, that's also a, a function of the bookcase, is that uh, if I move something out from the current month that I really like, but that I haven't got a finished copy for yet, I like finished copies for my collection, and uh, if I haven't yet got a finished copy, I will, I will hold on to the book just in case I don't ever get one, and this is My Seditious Heart, uh, a collection of the nonfiction writings of Arundhati Roy that, that filled her her creative years in between novels and it's terrific it's a little bit insider baseball and i'm very i'm very pleased with the publisher who, who did this uh haymarket books i'm very pleased with the publisher that they decided to include all of that stuff all that stuff that is indian politics uh, even though they know that 99.9 percent .9 of american readers won't know anything about it and aren't going to trouble to learn. They, it'll just be a turnoff for them for the book. They include it anyway because everything this author writes is worth saving. Everything this author writes is worth reading. Uh, and I loved it. I just loved it. But I don't think I ever got a finished copy of it. Uh, okay, this next one we've, we've seen on this channel. This is by Kenneth Dewey. This is uh, Great Plains Weather. <laughs> a, a thin little thing about some of the most ferocious weather anywhere in the United States. Uh, I have experienced Great Plains Weather up close. And it is... Uh, deeply humbling. <laughs> when it's in a mood, it's deeply humbling. <laughs> uh, the the cover very wisely shows uh, thunder, thunder and lightning. And uh, unless you have experienced them in the upper, in the upper elevations of some major mountain chain, like uh, the Rockies or the Alps, or especially the Himalayas, 
unless you have experienced a thunder and lightning storm there, you're never going to experience one more intense and more heart-stopping than in the Great Plains. <laughs> and so I, I had to keep this because uh, I thought I did a really spirited and eloquent job. Uh, oh, okay, all right, spirited and eloquent. Oh, this was a very tough reading, uh, a major work, so I, I definitely kept it. This is Darren Dochek's Anointed with Oil, his history of the, the horrible, entwined, nefarious, incestuous relationship between oil and Christianity in America. Uh, a, a very big book, a very fruitful subject. Oh my, a very fruitful subject. Uh, okay, this is an Australian super hottie, yes? Yeah, this is an Australian super hottie. Can never have enough of those. <laughs> uh, and this is a thriller by Jack Heath called Just One Bite, which uh, I really like despite its requisite boring American cover. Uh, and I, I have a, a soft spot for thrillers. And unlike a lot of things, including like, for instance, uh, a lot of the things we've seen so far, uh, even my beloved biographies, um, like The Second Most Powerful Man in the World or uh, The Great Successor, even books like that, which I, I love more than anything to read, I don't always have a taste to reread. And I love rereading thrillers. I just love them. For me, somehow, knowing the MacGuffin, the, the, the twist at the end, the thing that always is that great you know, uh, reason that you came moment in a thriller, that revelation moment at the end of a thriller, for me, somehow, knowing that moment enhances reading the thriller a second time. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's that it, I can appreciate any foreshadowing that the author does, although most of them are too dumb to do foreshadowing. I don't, I don't know what it is, one way or another. I love rereading thrillers. I do it all the time, so I tend to keep them, unless they are just bone dumb. Some of them are, and some of them are so poorly written. I'm willing to lower the bar quite a bit when reading a thriller when it comes to the prose, but some of them are so poorly written that even when the uh, the premise is great, I simply can't do it. I simply can't, I can't finish them, or if I do drag my way through them for that reveal moment at the end, I would never dream of rereading the perfect example this year's City of Windows. An absolutely terrific premise, and, and the world's most expert sniper at work in a city on apparently random victims during a killer snowstorm. That is a great premise, and the book is so noticeably poorly written. Every line, every paragraph has a line that just makes you go, what? What? The, the beds in a hospital emergency room are chariots waiting not to bring people to the, to the great beyond? Do chariots wait not to bring people? What a horrible way to put that. I just And profanity everywhere with no reason, just... Uh, but most of the time, I, I, if a thriller is competently done, I will hold on to it, sometimes for uh, an unjustifiably long period of time. <laughs> uh, okay, this is Walt Oditz, the legendary Walt Oditz. This is Out of the Shadows, his follow-up book on uh, relatively modern gay life. I, this is destined to be a classic, just like his other book. This is just fantastic. Uh, I would say uh, that if you're a gay man, and especially if you're a young gay man, you absolutely have to read it. But uh, outside of BookTube, I know quite a few young gay men and they do not read at all. In fact, I'm strongly, I strongly suspect that some of them would have a hard time remembering how to read. They don't do it at all. They are just, their lives are completely free, empty of literature. Uh, I don't know what that bodes for the future. <laughs> it certainly means we won't get any gay classics from gay writers, <laughs> unless they're women. Uh, uh, and the next one is also gay. This was a reprint with a, a small enlargement. <laughs> this is the gay metropolis, uh, and this is it was. It's just indispensable. It's just indispensable. Um, I was. It was a joy to reread. Uh, and then the final book on this shelf. Uh, so this is fifteen minutes. That's not bad. Uh, the final book on this shelf is uh, by Anita Anand, who did uh, Sophia. She did a biography of a minor, uh, uh, now minor, now totally forgotten. Uh, uh, Raj Princess and Sophia is a terrific book we actually saw it a million years ago at, you know, when this library tour started in my biography section and it, that it was so good it was such a fantastic book that it immediately put this author on a list where a mental list of mine where okay I will read every book that she writes uh, and this was her next one and it was even better it's just it doesn't have Sophia in the middle but uh, it's still a character study Excuse me, in fact, a dual character study. This is The Patient Assassin. Uh, the Amritsar Massacre. 
this is this is about a a massacre in, in the British Raj that maybe if you know anything about the British Raj you will know about it. Uh, but it was it's it was a, a catch point, um, a flashpoint for resentment for colonial resentment. Uh, the the typical shorthand for the massacre is that it was the beginning of the end of the Raj. Uh, and it was a whole bunch of civilians in a park who were just mowed down by soldiers because they shouldn't be there. <laughs> As if that makes a difference when you're firing on women and children. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've read many books on, on the massacre. It is blood curdling, even now after all this time. And there was, there was a man, he is, he is uh, a central figure in, in the mythology of Indian independence. And he claimed many times in his life that he was at that park, that he was one of the people fired upon. And whether or not that's true, there is no actual documentary evidence that he was there. And he changed his story a few times. But whether or not that was true, he waited for years until he could orchestrate the assassination of the man who ordered that massacre and did. Shot him at point blank range. Uh, and this is the story of of the 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 man who ordered the massacre, the man who carried it out, and the, the, the titular patient assassin who waited to kill them all, who wanted to, who wanted to, to strike a revenge blow for that massacre. And it's also, in a, in a very charming way, the, uh, the story of the author's uh, own ancestor, who, who was going to be in that park. It was just a, a momentary twist of, of happenstance that caused him not to be there, or he would almost certainly have been there and may have been killed. Uh, I just, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It had everything I loved about Sophia, uh, and an even broader scope. So I just, I thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's not, it's niche reading. Unfortunately, it's not, it's not going to be for everybody, but it was definitely, uh, for me and I reviewed it, uh, with all the shelves here, I will try to remember to include reviews for anything that, that I wrote up. Uh, and that's it. That is the first shelf of the Annex bookcases. <laughs> so we will try to bump this library tour along. We paused for a few days, but uh, maybe we'll pause for the weekend. But then on Monday, we'll, we'll pick it right back up because we've got a lot more books to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> I will see you soon. Thank you, Book 2.